Happy Monday, my Liberty Kitty Cats. And before we get into today's interview, I got to let you know about today's awesome sponsor. It's the Peddling Fiction Podcast, hosted by our good friend Johnny Perfita, who I just interviewed here last week on this very program. And as we discussed a bit on that episode, Johnny really has a uh, unique skill of being able to break down some uh Common statist concepts, uh, you know, like like the idea that taxation is not theft, for example, and really breaking them down so that people can really understand them, just dissecting them bit by bit. And he does a great job of that on every single episode of Peddling Fiction. On his latest episode, he took a look at the phrase you hear all the time right now with the election coming up, that our democracy is at stake. And uh, Johnny really breaks that down. And I want you guys to stay tuned to the end of this episode. We're going to play a little trailer for Peddling Fiction so you can get a little taste of what the show is about, but I don't think you even need to wait that long, guys. You should probably just pause this thing right now, go over, find Peddling Fiction on your favorite podcaster, smash that subscribe button. You are not going to regret it. Welcome to the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here is your host, your guide, your shining beacon of liberty, Mark Claire. All right, Kitty Cats, my guest today is making his return to this program. He is ex-military intelligence. He is the author of the book, A Direct Republic, The Null Hypothesis of Politics. That's what we spoke about the last time he was on this program. He has recently authored the book, The Art of War 2020. Very pleased to welcome back Donnie Gebert. Donnie, are you ready to roar? Roar. I had a feeling you might be Donnie because you you are not a quiet person. You're out there talking, uh, yapping about just about everything, whether it's on Twitter. I know you've been uh, on a Picanone show a lot, and uh, I always really enjoy speaking to you and hearing your perspectives on things. So before we get into your book, uh, Into the Art of War 2020, I want to just catch up with you a little bit and see. I think the well, first time we talked uh, was well before COVID, well before the lockdowns. So maybe you could just walk me few this through this last you know seven, eight, nine months for you. Uh, what were you first thinking when coronavirus sort of started hitting the headlines and uh, when we started seeing all these lockdowns what was going through your mind in terms of what we were actually seeing um when it first started i was pretty much somewhat on board with the idea that a virus possibly weaponized came out of china so you don't really get judgy about all that stuff you get protective about it and you take precautions and you just that is your new world now and you figure it out After 30 days, it was pretty obvious that the 14-day bug that was supposed to really mess you up takes at least longer than that. After 30 days, there wasn't any science left on Earth. (laughs) That's where we went. And here's how you know. An N95 mask guards 95% of particulate, that is 0.3 microns and above. And above not below. If you get one of the the N100 masks, it's 99.97% of 0.3 microns and above. Coronaviruses range from 0.08 microns to 0.16 microns, not 0.3, nowhere near 0.3. So the chances of most coronaviruses getting stuck in your mask is the chances of you getting stuck in a hallway. (laughs) And that was, and the, but but you have to understand, this is a weird year. 30 year financial. You think so? <laughs> I think year, that's one way to put this year. It was weird. That's one, 30, way to, one way to describe it. 30 year financial professionals don't know how money works. 30 year doctors are wearing cloth masks because the state told them to. Okay. 30 year teachers are starting to ask, what the hell is this curriculum all about, except for the known Marxists who are out throwing Molotov cocktails? So we're really starting to see that the system was not what we were told. We've all been living in a perceptive illusion that was held up by a magical printing press, and reality is just kind of coming home to all of this. And it's taking a whole year to really marinate and wow. The American dream really, you did really have to be asleep to believe it. But there it is. 
Uh, you mentioned that, you know, at first you did think this was, um, you know, a, a real vi- virus, a biological warfare, whether it was intentionally released or not at this time. Uh, I imagine your thoughts about this have changed quite a bit since then. So what do you think this was or is or has been in terms of an actual virus versus uh, what, what, regardless of the truth of the virus is, I think what, what we're seeing now, I, it's really hard to describe it as anything but a mass hysteria. But what do you think there is in terms of whatever truth there might be surrounding coronavirus itself? There's there seems to be a split. If you saw the pandemic video, there's a doctor and he's on there talking about people who had basically the symptoms of altitude sickness and they were having problems with their lungs. Then there's a bunch of talk about COVID-19, which may or may not be what the doctor was looking at. And then coronavirus, which is just a family of ignorance that we can all pass around real quickly because we all know how it works. So I saw what appeared to be attacks. It looked like an attack in New York and in Italy and in Iran and maybe in Wuhan and then around some of the meatpacking plants in America. It it looked like the fairy tale, I'll tell you, is that World War Three started when JFK got shot and everything since then has just been pure mayhem and chaos. That's it. And, And until 2008, nobody really even knew it was a war. But when the financial system started to seize, they needed replacements, et cetera. So I see COVID and then what appears to be underlying attacks. To to go into this, the CCP just ponied up hard drives against Hunter Biden. Okay, now this is a kinder general or CCP that seems to be deviating from what Xi would do. So there seems to be a split in the CCP and there seems to be a split in the federal government because... The FBI has had this stuff for a year, and, it, and it, it's not just political stuff, which would preclude a president from running, but it's criminal stuff that would prevent his son from walking around free. And everyone is just told to accept this. And if you don't connect the dots on your own, you don't quite realize it looks like the monet. All, so the, I just say that the COVID-19 portion is a big, I'll call COVID-19 is the propaganda arm. And then there is some kind of some kind of weapon that will hurt your, could be biological, could be chemical, that will hurt your lungs. But there seems to be this very, very, very few places that your lungs get hurt. And everywhere the internet goes is where COVID-19 goes. And the COVID-19 seems to be a cover story for the macro economy being restructured. That's why all this monetary movement is going on. And, and you know, everybody, 30-year guys are learning about money. So I see the propaganda campaign covering up the macroeconomic issue. And then there's this other criminal slash, you know, there might be some people who have <laughs> lunatic issues and they're going to take them out on large populations. And and then we're there just wallowing in the FUD all year. So it sounds like there, at least from your perspective, there's sort of just a mix of things possibly happening here, uh, possibly some actual attacks, some actual sort of biological weapon, which might explain uh, why you've seen really, really hard hit cities in select places and everywhere else is nothing like that. Uh, it's, it's nothing like what you see in New York City, Italy, Wuhan, uh, Iran. Uh, you don't see that anywhere else. Anywhere else you seem to be seeing more of a somewhat not very lethal, somewhat common uh, flu-esque, cold-esque sort of virus that people are testing for. Uh, even more so, the people are just testing for in mass and not even getting sick. The vast majority of people aren't even getting sick. Uh, while at the same time, you're sort of seeing maybe this, do you think this is actually uh, in some ways a pre-planned cover for these under Underlying macroeconomic issues that were going to come to the surface at some point anyway. And now that we're here, now we're at that we're at the point where the only way out of this, which isn't really getting us out of it, is to print trillions and trillions of dollars and just sort of chase the tail here as long as they can uh, while this economy sort of crumbles around. But now they can blame it and say, look, it's this coronavirus. There's nothing we could do. We're doing our best. Governments are lo- um, here's here's the structural. I like to talk about how, you know, a changing infrastructure will damage how a government functions. So when you look at what Mark Zuckerberg did with the Libra cryptocurrency, he demonstrated 30 governments freak out. Oh, Mark has to come and talk before Congress. Why? Because Mark Zuckerberg showed everyone that at least 30 governments are really worried about losing their ability to, to run a magical printing press. So every fraud that you can imagine has been perpetrated on all of us. And we're, we are all, there's a series of middlemen, and we can call it a macro economy. But the middlemen are getting fatter and fatter. And the process of pe- each people in person in their own link of the chain knows less and less about the chain as a whole. 
So the fraud in this chain is massive. Um, the banking system, what was it, two or three weeks ago? Two trillion in laundered money through HSBC. And uh, like, two, you can't accidentally launder two trillion. How do you get to 10 billion without noticing? And the answer is that looks like a macroeconomic thing that Jerome Powell printed whole. Then once it's printed whole, it's announced. When you're doing money money creation and, you know, in a debt-based system, the bank makes a debt for you, but they don't have any money. you got to go to Jerome Powell and get some of his. So he's the dealer, but the bank is an authorized dealer. So they will create a hole for you, and then you got to go get the current dollars to fill the hole in. If Jerome Powell just decides to be a good citizen and start filling in all those holes for everybody because the derivatives book is, is heavier than the actual market, then you could structure pretty easily a debt jubilee and the structured collapse of the derivatives books all at the same time. You could do that. And it looks like what he's doing, but who really knows how to do that because it's never happened before with a global reserve. You know what I mean? <clears throat> so there becomes about this much speculation to it, but then you have to explain what Jerome Powell did last Thursday. And it really looks like a structured demolition. And then this whole COVID-19 thing, this is right out of the, Oh, the Prop 201 playbook or, you know, uh, I forget the event, uh, agenda to event 201. Right. Of course, the first thing they tell you is we've never we've never practiced this scenario before. Of course. Right. And, and I tell you, I think the corporations got on board because if the governments fail, all the corporations lose their they lose their LLC. Basically, it's illegal. The, the corporation is a legal immunity for certain acts. And I think all the corporations are reinforcing the covid narrative. Because should the COVID narrative fail or the economy fail, the dollar economy, their their liability changes. Their their entire legal liability structurally changes, and I don't think none of them want that to change. That's what strikes me so much about everything going on uh, with COVID. There's there's a certain level going on with the government with uh, mandates, especially on the state levels uh, here in California. We're still under some kind of lockdown, uh, technically speaking. Uh, a lot of people aren't really following it in the same way they were three or four months ago. Uh, but, you know, you're still supposed to. I'm technically I don't do this because it's ridiculous. Uh, technically, when I go walk my dogs just outside the neighborhood by myself, just me and my dogs, I'm supposed to wear a mask. Uh, I don't do that because I'm a sane person, but I, I, I walk around around and I see a bunch of other people wearing masks looking at me like I'm a nut for not wearing it. Meanwhile, I'm even if you believe that there's a, a virus that I could transmit, I'm nowhere near anybody. Uh, so it, in so many, so many levels, it seems like this has transcended just whatever politicians are saying now. Now it's in, embedded in the psychology behind corporations and behind individuals. And uh, that's the kind of thing that frightens me way more than if the, the government was just out there making decrees. Um, you know, I know a lot of people, including myself, perhaps, that go to work and have all sorts of different... Th- not just questions they have to ask, but uh, people have to wear contact tracers. Uh, this is starting at the uh, quote unquote voluntary level at the private level. But we all know how this stuff works. Once this stuff gets embedded in uh, not just in our psychology, but literally on our phones, on our apps, everywhere we go, it's not going away. If it's not going to be used for this, it's going to be used for something else. You know what, Mark? Let me tell you something. I'm starting to think that the best way to defeat this mm-hmm. is to take Big Brother and rip grab it right by the tongue and pull it inside out. Because if you, you if you change your legal system to where almost nothing will get you in trouble, all of a sudden you and I are incentivized to spend almost all of our money openly. You don't necessarily want to know, like a cop can find out some of your purchasing history because he can go to a date and a time on the convenience store camera He can go to a date and a time on the register and he can see who did that purchase. You can't do that on the blockchain. You see an address and you see that a purchase went through. If you're a cop, you don't get any information from the blockchain that allows you necessarily to track it unless you know where this one address is. So when your businesses offer 50% of the information that you need to track a violent human, and your laws do not track nonviolent humans. There's no such thing as a financial crime. You know what I mean? A lot of these financial crimes are, we have an opinion about how you move money. And the people who move money for human trafficking, they move the same, it's the same way that you move cars. It's, it has, there's no inherent wrong with the way the financial transaction takes place. It's 
you are moving humans instead of cars. So then the government uses this as a blanket big brother thing because it's so hard to track who's doing the human trafficking that they need every and I, I am a huge uh, privacy guy, but traffic tracking human trafficking is very, very hard. And if you get a, a way to do it through the financials, you do that too. So everybody really needs a, a hot look at how these systems function because uh, redirect from where you think this should go here because the financial portion of this is we all move to blockchain and we're all winners. But if everybody thinks that blockchain is big brother, they freak out. Right. I mean, this ties into uh, just what you talked about, uh, but what you wrote your other book about direct Republic, the null hypothesis of politics. And, and uh, I'll just direct people to the interview we did. Uh, I don't know if it was late last year, or early this year, but I'll, I'll link to that in today's show notes, but maybe we can dovetail into more of the, the psychology behind this and the sort of war that's going on here. And this ties right into your book that you just wrote the art of war 2020. So why don't you just dive into a little bit at first, I'm kind of curious uh, what your history with the original art of war, uh, Sun Tzu's art of war. I read that I think in my 20s and uh, I, I found it pretty fascinating. I, I kind of want to go back and read it now because I think uh, at, the, at the time when I read that, I, I wasn't really into politics at all. I just read it because I thought it was interesting. But now that I've spent these you know, 10, 15 years here being really immersed in politics and seeing so much of this stuff play out in the political realm, uh, I think I'll probably see a little different perspective on it. But your book tries to take things uh, sort of a step further. But can I just give us a little bit of your background with The Art of War and why you decided to write this sort of updated version? in 2020 so the art of war is appendix one in my book so they're they're really not the same the art of war is very good at describing to you I, i'd like to call it i guess pro program manager or, or portfolio manager you have to understand your environment all the way out you have to understand all the decisions you're making um, there's three kinds of reasoning but the last one is kind of a lie there's inductive deductive and abductive reasoning Abductive reasoning is a reason. It's methodology. I already have a method. I am going to stick this piece in this part of my, in this part of whatever project I'm doing, I am going to use this piece. I already know it. I already have it budgeted. So when you call this reasoning, it might, it might throw somebody off to the different, you know, politics is war by other means. So you're really caught in this under, you believe you have an understanding of politics. Well, if you don't, use it correctly, you misuse it. That's that's what not using it correctly is. So if you're making a bunch of accidental victims because you don't know how this works, that's what voters do. They don't realize that they, they've been given a vote and they don't realize it's the poison that they don't want. You don't want one bucket of funds and to vote on it from two sides. You want two buckets of funds and no voting. So when you confuse people with all of their logical hands off, you know, in, in a military supply train, and, and Sun Tzu gets into the battlefield. So it's all three-dimensional space. If you lose anything in your logistical supply train, it's gone. The end. You don't get to argue that your shit is gone. Your shit is gone now. <laughs> well, if you do this in an intellectual handoff, you have created a logical fallacy. Your, your point may not get across. Maybe you accidentally instructed somebody poorly, and now they're about to go cause a disaster because you're a dumb. So you have to find, you have to make sure that you, the IKEA diagram of how it actually functions is what you know, how you're conveying it to another person. If they don't get it, you figure out how they're misunderstanding it so you can convey it correctly. My book gets into you're stuck on the battlefield that Sun Tzu describes, and you're one human. How are you going to sense make on a day to day? And then you know when you start taking that to war, it gets harder and harder and harder. Because now one of the things you're dodging is live ordinance. But, but sense making the way people are just, you know, politics is war by other means. Everyone is yelling at each other like a bunch of screaming primates. Well, sense making in that environment is very difficult for people because the handoffs go from philosophical, which happens between your ears, to methodological, which happens outside your window, to real life, which what happened outside my window? Was it assembled correctly? Was it funded properly? Was it funded by the blood of the children? You know, how did all of this happen? And you find out that most people don't know anything about what they're doing. And you can, you can account for almost all of the bad stuff on earth because somebody doesn't know how to do their job, not because somebody's a nepotistic, sinister human being. 
Yeah, I mean, talk about people not knowing what they're doing and, and trying to communicate with each other. I mean, so many people today are trying to convince each other of their belief system of who to vote for or what have you by tweeting at them in capital letters or by, you know, by, by these short little sound bites or by yelling at them for not wearing a mask when they're when they're out in the street. And if you actually try to have a real conversation outside of that and, and break it down, you quickly realize people don't know what they're talking about. And don't even care to. Uh, they care to repeat phrases. They care to just sort of signal what their beliefs are supposed to be. But where does that get us? Yeah. People are now comfortable to walk down the street in civil society, command strangers that there is a virus afoot, and they don't understand that the size of what they're talking about is called the common cold. Coronaviruses are part of the family known as the common cold. And we have already accepted as a species a long time ago, you can't prevent the common cold on scale because that's how it happens. So now there are believers that will imagine the most belligerent, you know, um, Mm -hmm. religious person going down the street, the most, you know, Christian or Muslim or whatever going down the street. Imagine them witnessing to you like this. They're not just handing out tracts and inviting you to church. They're demanding that you cover your mouth. <laughs> so that, that's where I really get upset with the females. Because they demand that you put a, a, a filthy rag on your, on your face all day, essentially. I to, reckon, show, to show that we're in this together. It's not even about a disease. It's about to show that we're all in this together. Look, these people are sacrificing. There's people on the front lines. There's people dying. If you don't put it on, you're not on the right team. You're part of the problem. My understanding of feminism for 40 years now was intelligent assertion of women on the same level as men. Well, then women demanded equality, and that's not the same thing because dudes are dumb. So if you start trying to intelligently assert yourself the same way that guys do, you will then be dumb. So, you know, how do you get a feminist to obey a man? You have Anthony Fauci tell her to cover her mouth. And all of them fell for it, like just like that, all of them. So the women weren't there to keep the dumb dudes from not knowing how stuff worked, which is the only reason (laughs) civil society didn't die out five, six hundred years ago. So your take might actually be the most feminist take I've heard. (laughs) Your take on this might actually be the the most feminist take I've heard in terms of what I feel feminism, you know, is, you know, know, we need them to be the strong ones to stop stop us from being so damn dumb. But they're well, not now they're, they get, you know, you got to be careful what you ask for. Now they get equality. Now they're just as dumb as all the dudes and we don't have to <laughs> pretend they're special anymore. So everybody's really going to learn some science and their opinions are kind of going to get muzzle loaded right down that mask. And it's going to get worse in the future. The more people try to keep this up, that they're going to find out that the mask won't keep their teeth in. They're going to keep wandering up to strangers as if they know how science works and they're just going to get their teeth knocked out. And whether or not they were correct won't be relevant to whether or not their food is liquid for six to eight weeks. It won't be relevant. And then they're going to find out later. Oh, shit. Point one, six microns doesn't doesn't help in a point point three micron mask. Right. And then we can get into T-shirts. But that just looks like panties in the mouth. Well, I do see people even just wearing, I mean, I see people just doing this, just pulling their t-shirt above their mouth and walking around like, like they're doing something like, <laughs> look, I, I play the game. I right. play the game. But that's what it is at this point. It is just a signal. It's just saying I'm on board. I am not going to dissent from the system. Don't worry about me. You don't have anything to worry about. I'm not going to shake things up. That's essentially what I'm ask is at this point. It's just saying I'm here. I'm a bang. I'm on board. Don't worry. I haven't found any rules, and I mean any rules in any game you could play to which there is not one exception. So my exception is Costco. It's the only place I wear a mask, and it's because it's not my account. It's my ex-wife's. So rather than having account issues, I'll just make my exception in this place, and it's the only place I do it. And if everybody just stopped, we go back to being the same susceptible. You know, when you brand name the, the common cold, it doesn't change the common cold. So we don't have to pretend anymore. This was all fake. We all got duped. And it's harder for people to admit they got duped than it is for them to adjust. All right, kitty cats, I got to take a quick time out here to tell you guys about our other amazing sponsor this week. That is our good friends over at Lauren Zadi 
Italy. These guys uh, have some amazing coffee, some premium blends that you got to check out. You can find them all over at laurenzotti.coffee, but these guys don't just produce amazing coffee. They are really, not only are they entrepreneurs themselves and great libertarians, but they're trying to help other people become entrepreneurs in the same space. Uh, If you're sick of these generic coffee shops everywhere now, just Starbucks, the coffee beans, uh, and really would like to see more actual coffee shops where, you know, where people are actually go and mingle, hang out, they're not just staring at their phone the whole time. This is a world that we can have back, and our friends at Lorenzotti Italy help people do that by uh, procuring equipment for them, by offering financing, by helping people set up their own coffee shops as well as selling their own amazing blends of coffee. So they really are a one-stop shop for the coffee connoisseur and coffee entrepreneurs. I want you to head over to lorenzotti.coffee. That's lorenzotti.coffee. And do not forget, you'd be fools to forget to use your discount code LIONS at checkout for 10% off your order. That's discount code LIONS. Your book, uh, The Art of War 2020, it really digs into a lot of sort of abstract concepts. I I think it's the kind of book you might have to read like two or three times to really let everything sink in. So we're not going to, you know, necessarily break down every single one of those concepts now. But what's a good starting point for people that, you know, they maybe they realize, okay, what Donnie's saying is right here. I don't actually really know how to combat, how to use myself, my intellect as an individual, how to stand up for myself in this crazy society, in this place where there is psychological warfare playing, being played uh, at the mass scale where there's literally a mass hysteria that's overtaken the world that's infected far more people than any virus has. Uh, So where can someone start by using the knowledge gained from your book in actually, you know, waging war in their own way uh, from the individual level? My book is Ignorance is the Enemy. Sun Tzu's book is Know Your Your Enemy, Know Yourself. So if you go to war in three-dimensional space with another human, it really is going to be exploiting their ignorances or their incapabilities to defeat them. Well, if you are ignorant, you will do this to yourself. The end. Never mind all of the things that everybody would like to blame. Here, I'll give you a personal story. I'm paranoid. But what does a paranoid five-year-old look like in 1983? Nobody knows because everybody's dodging lawn darts because it was 1983. (laughs) Why do the parents not, or the grandparents, they don't eat at the, at the table in the yard anymore. Why not? Lawn darts. They don't want that crap while they're eating. They'll eat on the porch. They're not going down there. So I was paranoid and just learned to live in an environment where pointy objects were flying around my head. If I thought that somebody threw that lawn dart at me on purpose, I'd stab them with it. However, if it was an accident. So the fact that I was paying attention and dodging lawn darts it was helpful. It wasn't anybody being malicious to me. I recognize there's a difference between me perceiving something a lot, you know, often at a high level and me projecting that that person over there had a motive to make me pay attention to this, right? When you're paranoid, if somebody jostles you like that, you you can't project and say that person did it to me on purpose. You just have to recognize that they're living their life and they're clumsy. And now you're dodging lawn darts. So everybody seems to get this projection thing about them where if they don't understand something, it's someone else's fault. That's where you, that's where your ignorance will just live forever. So my book is you're going to take, I'll be honest, you take one concept at a time and you apply it to everything you know first, and then you go get another one. Cause that's kind of how I do it. I had to learn what is the concept of zero in an electrical system? It's ground. So you got positive and you got negative and you got ground. On a roulette wheel, you got black and you got red and then you got green. Well, in an electrical system, you actually do have two greens. You have zero, which is ground, and you have double zero, which is a short. So the whole system... Just like the roulette wheel. Just like the roulette wheel. But nobody's planning on double zero in an electrical system. So if you know how to break it in a certain way, you can get it to function in a different manner. And that's the real trick is you take you take certain pieces of the book and you learn how to go play games and you apply strategy from one concept that you know how and you say, OK, this template works really good over here as well. So, I mean, when you realize that that project management goes through every single profession, every single profession go, has project management, but they all have different languages. So when you when you really study project management, you're studying how everything on earth works in a process management sense. And then you just get industry specific language for 
tech, industry specific language for HR, industry specific language for government, food service. That's all it is. But the systems really are just hiding behind language. And as soon as other people recognize, you learn how things fall apart. The internet is causing people to understand more of the bullshit. They, they, under, they don't necessarily know how to fix it, but they know it's not going to work like that. So that's kind of where I, you know, first book it is solutions department. This is, if you can't figure out your place in politics because it's crazy, then you need to learn that first. How did you, we apply this concept of zero, uh, you know, to our everyday p- political lives or to the way that we view politics and uh, the, the words, the machinations of politicians? Well, politics is methods. We're not, you know, you're having a discussion with your family and it's theoretical, but then it's supposed to go and function in three-dimensional space. So if you're going to have a philosophical debate, that's fine. But when you're done with your philosophy, you have to apply a method. And then you have to see if that method is going to live up to this philosophy. And that's usually where people get lost. So you got to look at three things. You got to look at positive, negative, and null. You're going to look at the Republican case. You're going to look at the Democrat case. And then you're going to look at null. If I don't care about Republican or Democrat, how would I do this from the ground up just to make it function like it was a business? I'm trying to do, I'm trying to make it on a budget. I'm not trying to be extravagant. I'm not looking for a government loan. How does this actually work? And that's where you're starting to see on Joe Biden's fraud thing. It's exactly how everybody gets to look at the law is written so that Joe Biden's son can take all of the political money needed and Joe Biden gives the legal appearance of not involved in uh, corruption, crime, nepotism. What he really is doing is a show in front of the cameras when the reality is different. Even if it was legal for him to be involved in the Chinese, what if it was expected that an American president would spend his own money in a foreign land to strengthen business ties? What if that was the job of the president? Donald Trump is in a better position to do it than Joe Biden. Joe Biden's doing the opposite of that. He's becoming a leech in that system. Donald Trump has foreign investment where he's saying, hey, we're not a bunch of shitbag Americans like the Bidens. We will invest in your infrastructure. We will get your people employed with our hotel chain. You know what I mean? So if you really don't know how it works, you are just a voter. And that vote is like a child with a gun. It really, really is like a child with a gun because you don't know how all that shit works. And now you're going to you're going to throw your two cents in. Just run around throwing throwing lawn darts all over the place. <laughs> Dodging a lawn dart when you're five is is a skill. It's a skill. Yeah, we're, we're dodging lawn darts, uh, I guess. Uh, I don't know if they're intellectual lawn darts, but we're a verbal lawn darts uh, everywhere out there in politics where people are just now we're just attacking each other with phrases, with words, with hashtag wear a mask uh, or wear the damn mask, as I, I prefer to, to, to get angry at out there. Um, maybe, maybe you can dive in a little bit to one of the concepts you break down early on in the book. Uh, and it's, it's something you bring up a lot, this idea of, of Rube, Rube Goldberg. I hear you bring it up all the time uh, on, on various other interviews. Uh, you kind of break down Rube Goldberg versus the Socratic method. I think a lot of people out there will be familiar with the Socratic method, but maybe you can break down just exactly what you mean by this comparison, talking about the how versus the why. I'm going to put the two of them together where you left off with people yelling, you know, the verbal lawn darts. Well, who is authorized? Remember, America is all about legal immunity. Who's authorized to throw verbal lawn darts? It's the lawyers. Okay. They are authorized. So when you start seeing the methodology, Rube Goldberg is your methodology. Socratic method is how you're supposed to deal with your politicians. Why is it this way? Well, when they give you an emotional reason as to why something is happening, what you have is an ideology, not a methodology. So you start asking more specific questions like, how is this happening? And then you get the politician who doesn't know how it works and he starts talking around it. Recent example, someone says, There's a conflict of interest, Joe, with you and your son in Ukraine. And Joe looks at him and says, there's no indication of a conflict of interest. (laughs) You know, if I put a car in my driveway, I could say there's no indications of a car there. I could say there is a car there, but I'm really just trying to shift the focus. And then as soon as Joe said that, he gives the angry pants. We're going to focus on Donald Trump. So it's really it's 100 percent bullshit. The hardest part to get the average person involved into understanding 
Rube Goldberg's Socratic method is you go into your bathroom, you look in the mirror and you ask the dumb son of a bitch in the mirror, why? Why did I ever believe Joe Biden? I'm a dummy. I'm, I'm a dummy. And until you have that moment with yourself, it doesn't, you're really not going to get it. Let me flip it around. When you're, when you perform, my first book is uh, political area denial. You take, you don't have any, it's all peer to peer and there's no middlemen. When you take Joe Biden out of the process, I get my agency back and it's mine. Well, you get your agency back and it's mine. It's mine. See, it, the, our language somehow doesn't do that right. But I get my agency back. You get yours back. Mine is mine. Yours from your perspective is mine. Right, right. The next person, it becomes a political minefield. I know that's stupid. But this is how you could use the words to make a point. When every person is their own representative, it's a political minefield because everyone's agency is mine. That's why you're told selfishness is bad, because the minute you say, I don't want to be involved and I'm not going to pay for it anymore. You're now a social heretic. Your mask isn't thick enough. Your brain is too big. Whatever, whatever insult is going to be thrown, you're the one who understands that not participating is how the game ends. So every screaming primate tactic you could come up with will be used against that human to get it back into the game. Because the fewer people that play, the, the illusion is broken. And then everybody realizes the game wasn't what the game was all an illusion of a printing press anyway. I mean, that explains this, what we see everywhere. And I we see it not just at the government level. We see it at the corporate level. Uh, we see it at the individual level. It's similar to the mask thing. It's like, just go vote. Get out and vote. Hashtag get out and vote. Vote, vote, vote. Everywhere right. you go. And it's it's right. acted like we don't care how you vote. I think most of the times when, when you actually look at who it's coming from, there is actually is a way they want you to vote when they're saying that. Uh, but it's it's really this idea that if you don't vote, well, you're, you're just you're, you're as bad as uh, someone who doesn't wear a mask. You're out. You're not part of the team. You're not united with us. Uh, you're not playing the same game. And that's the most offensive thing you can do uh, when you're a part of the cathedral is to say you don't want to come in the doors. You want to hear a story of justice? I All voters deserve hemlock. <laughs> okay? That's a just outcome. Ever, there are no losers in a good democratic system. Everybody gets the same. So they all get the hemlock and everybody's equal. But, but when you don't really understand what that system is about, it's about the illusion of choice. There were people who didn't like what Socrates was doing, so they manipulated the crowd and poisoned him in plain sight. But the voter will pretend that their government school education covers the, covers the spread between politics now and Socrates. They, they got this. They got this. They got a pile of vocabulary words, and they know how it functions. And they, they know you what know hashtags you? to tweet and what phrases to shout at you. So what more do you I need? Know as long as you're saying the right things through the mask, it'll all be okay because that's how reality functions. Well, Donnie, this uh, this episode is going to be the final episode of Lions of Liberty that airs before the election. So I just want to toss this out there to you. Where do you see things going? Not even necessarily just in the result, although I'm certainly curious uh, your thoughts about that. But where do you see this all going as a society, a society level? Uh, my dad thinks that COVID goes away as soon as uh, as soon as the election's over. I'm not quite I'm not quite as optimistic about that as he is. Uh, but where do you see everything that we've this sort of warfare that's been going on? It didn't start with uh, with 2016, and it's not going to end with 2020. So where do you see things going uh, post election these next few months here? Uh, um, I don't think it's going to be fun either way. <laughs> I will say as an authorized security professional inside of the United States government that Joe Biden will not be allowed to have a security clearance because of the manner of, of what I have already seen in public from those hard drives. He will not be allowed to see top secret material as a president. And if he does, then you might as well not have a top secret system. I'm all about destroying that system. I really am. But Joe Biden wouldn't really qualify for a clearance. He might actually qualify for an indictment. That might be before the election, and that's only, what, 10 days or something like that? Yeah. There are two dates in the future. One is the election, which, frankly, I just hope blows up and is canceled. However, Donald Trump has spoken of January 1st. He got a deal. He got the greatest deal. He doesn't actually say what it is because that's how NDAs work. So for as much as I, I know how deals are structured, and if it's under an NDA, he can't talk until the 1st. The, the Banking for All Act Federal Reserve 
and I use the word specifically, shall have digital wallets available by January 1, 2021. So I think COVID lasts until the monetary system gets the, the rude awakening on the whole thing. And I could get conspiratorial and I could, I could dive into it. As far as everybody's concerned, I don't think any of the voting is going to help. I think the systems are so fraudulent that about 14 days afterwards, they're just going to find out pure fraud, pure fraud, pure fraud. What's next? And then I think we're going to get our banking our banking notification that the $2 trillion that was in the banking system, plus the way Jerome Powell's been driving the U.S. dollar, and somehow we're, Donald Trump has restructured under a under the Treasury instead of under the Federal Reserve, and there won't be borrowed money paid back with interest. Uh, but that's my two cents. Like it's so hard to tell. It's so hard. To yeah, tell. I mean, something you mentioned there is what I'm most worried about is no matter what the result is with all this mail-in vote and early voting, all, all this stuff. There's going to be half the country that thinks that they got screwed over, that there was fraud, and that their side should have won or should be in power. And uh, that's just a recipe for, uh, I guess, in some ways, more of the same as we've seen the last four years or so, but uh, probably to an even more extreme degree. If 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 half the country actually thinks that they've been now screwed over, that they have have been defrauded out of the power that they deserve or feel they deserve or feel their team should have. I know 325 million people that deserve more than one bucket. So they don't have to vote over it. Mm -hmm. So if you had here, here's how I would do that. If I was Donald Trump, dot, 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 I would look everyone in the face and say, I will no longer be accepting the presidency, regardless of how you vote. If you want to come with me into the future, I would have Donald Trump pick a, pick a, a cryptocurrency that functions at random and say, everyone revalue your entire lives in this thing. And we are going to take our economy and our opinions and our lives, and we are going to dump the dollar. Now, as a U.S. president, he really can't do that. And I think he's going to do that with this, uh, with the digital currency that comes out of, the, out of the central bank. But I could be wrong. You know what I mean? That's how I would do it, because it would it would say all the Trumpies are coming with me and you guys have the shit system. Have it. Have at it. It's all you. You can keep it. But I'm a spiteful bastard. I would I would make it happen. I wouldn't talk about it and then let everybody vote it. I would just collapse that system and, and say we're going this way. Real leadership instead of the. Instead of the this is we're going to do this every four years because we don't know why. That's what I would do, but I have no idea what's coming. I don't think any of us do. And that's, that's what makes it so fun, exciting, and scary all at once. So, Donnie, it's, uh, it's been a blast talking to you. It's always fun uh, talking to you and getting your opinion on things. Uh, we'll have to, to make this uh, a semi-regular stopping point for you. Uh, before I let you go, why don't you just uh, let everybody know how they can find all, all your books out there, yeah, The Null Hypothesis, as well as your most recent, The Art of War 2020. The Null Hypothesis of Politics.com. Uh, the art of war 2020.com. Both of the books are free. They're a PDF download. Um, the first one, there's kind of, I haven't, I had a guy volunteering to do the audiobook and it hasn't come in. I have it uh, done where the PDF read aloud is also on an audio for the first one. The second one has pictures and stuff in it. So you have to read that one because they're one. When you're dealing with abstract concepts, if I didn't put any pictures in that book, everyone would think I'm insane. <laughs> So you have to really look at this picture and then think of this concept and equate the two and understand there's a mechanical relationship there. And don't let this relationship smash you in the face. And then you go on to another mechanic. Um, you know, time, scope, and cost is how project management is done. So when you start learning how to manage those things in your life, it be here's the phrase. It's called cursed with knowledge. When you know something, you can't be lied to anymore. So the goal is to get your own head in the game and understand not just the game, but yourself and your place in it. And it's hard to, you know, without some abstracting and understanding the mechanics, it's hard to find. So artofwar2020.com. All right, Donnie Gebert, artofwar2020.com. Check it out, kitty cats. And uh, until next time, Donnie, keep up the great work, man. Keep on roaring. Thank you, sir. All right, my Liberty Kitties, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Donnie Gebert. Always enjoy talking to him. You got to check out his book, The Art of War 2020. We'll, of course, post links to that over at the show notes page at our brand new lionsofliberty.com. Totally revamped website. Thanks to our patrons. Thanks to the people who fund this program, the members of the Lions of Liberty Pride who support us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash lionsofliberty. They don't just send us money. They get tons of 
extra bonus content in return, uh, a bunch of live streams. They got to see the live stream of the recording of the ridiculous, absurd, and very, very fun Halloween episode of Electric Liberty Land this week. Uh, also, what they'll get to see live will be our coverage of the election tomorrow night. Now, that will be repurposed as an episode of Electric Liberty Land on Wednesday, but we will be doing it live uh, for patrons of our show. Uh and frankly, we don't even expect to have an election result by the si- time we sign off. Uh, but we p- do plan to do that and go live at around 10 p.m. Eastern just to talk about what kind of results have been pour- pouring in, what it looks like so far. And, um, you know, I'm sure by the time it airs on Wednesday, it'll all be out of date. But guess what? If you're in the Pride, you can see that live as we talk about it. While well, it's still relevant because we know things are going to be pretty, pretty crazy, especially uh, for folks like me out here in, in major metropolitan uh, blue areas like Los Angeles. Let's just say I expect some I expect some hecticness. But either way, be sure to tune in to Electric Liberty Land on Wednesday on this very podcast feed, wherein my colleague in Liberty, Brian McWilliams, slaps you upside the head with his weekly shot of comedy, culture, and liberty. While on Fridays, John Odie Odermatt wraps things up with his hard-hitting, inspiring look at the broken criminal justice system on Felony Friday. That's why you got to hit that subscribe button, guys. You got to smash the heck out of that thing because you don't want to miss a single show. We got three different unique episodes every single week and so much more. If again, you are a member of the Pride on Patreon, patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty. If it just can't get enough after that, don't forget myself, along with our friend Remzo Martinez, we host the weekly Second Print Comics podcast. We do deep dives on all sorts of different uh, comic book characters, stories, and events that influenced our fanhood. Even if you're not a fan of comics, and you really should be, and maybe you'll find out why by listening to the show, I think you're going to enjoy our banter, uh, just like you'll probably enjoy the banter of Brian, Odie, and Rico on their little side project, Bravo and Beer. And all I'm going to say is, you got if you haven't heard Odie almost die from a beer bong on, on, on in audio form, well, you got to go back and listen to last week's Bravo and Beer. I'll just say that. Folks, it's been a blast. I'm sure we're going to be in a very different, uh, very interesting world by next Monday. But until then, my friends, live long! And live free. Anyone claiming that America's economy is in decline is peddling fiction. And libertarians are better Democrats than the Democrats and better Republicans than the Republicans. A Republican president, a Republican-controlled Congress, presided over the biggest expansion of government up to that point in history. And what's going to happen when they realize that Social Security is nothing but a racist, sexist, ageist, Ponzi scheme? I mean, how badly do you have to screw something up before we finally conclude that uh, maybe government can't solve this problem? The free market is the ultimate expression of democracy. I do the show two days a week. It's a free show. You sure you don't want to see some evidence to back up any of their claims before you get us into another war? Their entire existence is exploitative. Everything they eat, everything they drink, the roof over their heads. It was all paid for from theft at the threat of violence. Isn't it interesting that an education system run by the government somehow churns out a bunch of people who favor the government handling everything? That's the type of accounting that would get you thrown in prison if anybody else were to do it. But that's how the federal government operates. Black, white, Indian, Asian, rich, poor, short, tall, everybody benefits from freer markets. Libertarianism is principled, it's philosophically sound. In the arena of ideas, we cannot be defeated. This is the Peddling Fiction Podcast. The voice and soul of so-called fiction. Follow me on Twitter at Pedal Fiction. Download and subscribe. And no matter what happens, keep on pedaling that so-called fiction. Peace.
Peace.